Good morning and welcome to Harbour Church. My name is Corey and it's great that we can be gathered again in person this morning. Welcome to those of you online as well. Happy Father's Day. Dads, I'm sure this is a time you look forward to every year, a time your children get to tell you how much they love you and appreciate all the great things you've done for them. Of course, it doesn't have to be this one day of the year that they can tell you that. They can tell you at any day of the year. Uh, and it's the same with the children of uh, the Heavenly Father, the children of God, uh, who we come to praise and worship here at church. Uh, they can still do uh, any other day of the week as we should. Um, so as we gather this morning, I'll read the words of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Um, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Here the Apostle John uh, is talking, of course, about the Father's love uh, shown to us in sending his son Christ Jesus to die to save us and to rise again as our Lord. This term at Harbour Church, uh, we have a sermon series on 1 Corinthians, a letter written by Paul that helps clarify what, ch what church should and shouldn't look like. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from our pastor, Rob, uh, preach on chapter 11 about order in God God's church uh, and also about women in head coverings. Uh, oddly poetic seeing as it's Father's Day, but anyway, uh, we'll see that within the church, uh, God has a good design for both men and women to care for all and establish his own glory. Uh, while this passage may seem confusing or contentious at first, we'll be asking God to speak through his truth through Rob uh, so that we might better understand it. In celebration of Father's Day, uh, we're actually going to have a bit of a game now, particularly for the dads, but still it should be fun for everybody. Um, it's a dad joke challenge. Um, the way it'll work is uh, I've got five dad jokes here uh, and basically I'm going to read out the, the question or the setup to the joke uh, and if a dad can stick up their hand if they know if they think they know what the punchline is and if they get it right uh, they'll, they'll get a point, their family can get a point. Uh, the family with the most points will be winning this, this bar of chocolate uh, either to take selfishly or to share with their family. Um, of course, if, if that person gets it wrong, um, I'll hand it over to somebody else with their hand up. Um, does that make sense? Do I have any questions about how this is going to work? Awesome. All right, let's get started. We don't exactly believe in this as an Anglican church, but there's still humour in it nonetheless. Um, how do you make holy water? Any, any ideas, dads? I can open it to the floor. Anybody, anybody got an answer? All right, uh, you boil the hell out of it. Um, <laughs> what is a child guilty of if they refuse to sleep during nap time? Terrorism. No, not quite. They are resisting arrest. <laughs> um, why did the invisible man turn down the job offer? Any thoughts? <laughs> Why did the invisible man turn down the job offer? <laughs> he couldn't see himself doing it. <laughs> uh, what did the pirate say on his 80th birthday? Uh, not, not quite R. Uh. I, matey. <laughs> Alright, we've got one more question. Um, if nobody gets this, I don't know what's going to happen with the chocolate. Um, <laughs> Alright, uh, what is Forrest Gump's password? <laughs> Nate? One Forrest one. Oh my goodness, Nate's got it! <laughs> Great job. Do you want to come collect chocolate for your family? <laughs> One forest, one. One forest, one. Thank you. No worries. Mean I'm a dad now? I suppose so. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well done, the sharks. Okay, I'm going to pray to open our service. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that through the sacrifice of your Son, through being adopted children by you, we have the privilege of calling you Abba, Father. We thank you for this day where we can celebrate the gift of fatherhood and ask that families will bond closer over today, as well as closer to you. Father, we, ask, uh, we thank you for the kids and youth at Harbour Church as well. We ask that you'll be working in them by the power of your spirit this morning, that they will be better equipped with the gospel and that their faith in you may be further strengthened. We ask these things for ourselves as well as we hear from 1 Corinthians 11 in today's service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to watch a Father's Day video up on the screen behind me. One thing I'm thankful for about my dad, particularly, um, I guess, in the last 10 years of having kids, is that he's been very encouraging. My dad's always trying to encourage, encourage me. Yeah, look, the best thing about my dad, my dad passed away a few years ago, but he was a great leader. He loved his family, and his family was everything to him. And he was just a man that helped anybody and everybody. What I'm thankful for about having God as my Heavenly Father is it's having a dad's great that can fix stuff. Having God as my Father, there is nothing that is outside of his power to make good. I love that. Uh, what I like about my Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father is always there for me. He brings me peace, joy, happiness, love, wisdom, and uh, everything that I go to do, I take through him. That's what I love about it. Bye. <laughs> If I could have a superpower, it would be to have my own theme tune wherever I went. It would follow my mood. So if I'm happy, it would be like... <laughs> if I was sad, it would be like... Dum, 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 dum. Um, I reckon that would be a great superpower. Uh, my superpower, if I had one, would be the ability to fly. I think it would be great to be able to fly anywhere. I think it would be an awesome feeling. Uh, one thing that God has power over that I think is awesome is just power over death. Like if I have to say goodbye to a loved one and they love Jesus, I know I'll see him again. Uh, God's power over everything is uh, just encouraging to me to know that it's all in his hands. I don't have to worry about anything and uh, all I have to do is pray and he's always there by my side. Awesome. Rob, would you like to come to church news? Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, to dads out there, happy to add my happy Father's Day. It is great to be together. And, uh, you know, Father's Day, it's not all about the gifts, but they're good. And so I thought, why not give the best gift we can? Um, Psalms for You is a great book because it's about the Psalms that God has given to His people. In fact, the Psalms that even Jesus would have sung and prayed. So, uh, if you would like to have a look under your chair, there are two chairs that have a post-it under it. Uh, as a giveaway for today, the gift it will be yours. Oh, we've got one over there. All right, come on up. Uh, no, that's not it, Dave. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a look around. There's, got to be, there's one over there. Robin, well done. Come on down. Thank you. Great Thank work. You. Thank you. All right. And uh, still selling them. Still got a couple of copies left. 15 bucks. Uh, if you uh, just are feeling this point in time so ripped off, um, then feel free to come and buy one. All right. 
Next thing is to do with the Lord's Supper. Now, unfortunately, due to COVID, we haven't been able to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, for a couple of months now, even having come back, just due to the logistics of it. But next Sunday, as we look at the second half of 1 Corinthians 11, it's all about the Lord's Supper. And I was just thinking, we've got to do it. It's just, you, you can't not hear God's word and then not uh, celebrate. So, here's how I'm proposing we do it. It's a BYO situation. Everybody's got to bring your own bread and juice, no sharing. Uh, I know that feels unchristian, but it's just got to be for you. So you bring your bread, you bring your juice or liquid or however you want to drink. That's totally fine. And we will go through the Lord's Supper together in that particular way. So I'll be sending out reminders during the week, but just a heads up, that's what we're aiming to do. And for you online, even easier. Uh, you can just dash to the kitchen and grab what you need. But that'll be happening next week. And of course, uh, COVID still continues to impact uh, our country and our, our society. And so just an encouragement again, as we do each week, if you are in need of help, both here at church or even online, uh, please let us know. We'd love to be able to get alongside you. But also, if you'd like to connect with us, whether that be to say hi, find out more about church, ask for prayer, ask any questions, you can go to our webpage and then on the very front page, there's a way to connect with us. You just put in your email and uh, we'll be able to get in touch with you. Well, that's it for church news. I'm going to invite Klaus here to come up. Good morning, church. Um, we're going to be pray, praying this morning for our mission partners for Father's Day. And I'm going to close with Ephesians 3, but from verse 14. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the opportunity to be together in fellowship this morning. We pray for our mission partners in Broome, in South, South Asia, and in Vanuatu. We thank you for the chance to hear about the progress and work in the field this week in our growth groups. We pray for them to continue to uh, be sustained uh, by you and for the opportunity to growth of your kingdom where they are. We pray for Father's Day today. Bless all the fathers who have accepted the responsibility of being a parent. Um, help them and guide them in be role models uh, to their children and to have patience and wisdom in the difficulties. Thank you for their love, for the fathers who are still here with us, but we also pray for comfort uh, to the hearts of children whose fathers are no longer with us. May we look to you, our Father in heaven, for the unconditional love you have for us. And for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, we may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning everyone. I'm going to read the Bible for us this morning and I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 starting at verse 1. Um, but before I do that, uh, let me pray for us. Lord in heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your revelation to us through your word. 
We just pray, Lord, that today as we hear from you, that you will give us a clearer understanding of who you are and your purpose in this world and for us as followers of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realise that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonours his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Well, these days, the church and the Bible are accused of oppressing women. And as a church, and those who want to sit under God's word and value women, this is a serious topic for us. Now, we might be thinking, really, Father's Day? Actually, I think it's the perfect day. Because we're already starting to think about one aspect of the difference between men and women but also because we are remembering our loving Heavenly Father who wants good things for his children, both his sons and daughters. The issue that people have is with, that God has designed different roles for men and for women. Some see that as God crushing women. And so they rightly say, that's not on. Others, uh, particularly when they view it as more, well, it's the church or a way of reading the Bible by certain people, uh, is, is really squeezing women. And they really just want to get back to the way that God made them, but the church keeps squeezing them into a different shape, a different mould. So how do we understand it? And a passage like this. Well, I think it would be really good for us to go back to the beginning, to think through Genesis 1 and 2. So come with me on the journey, if you like. Uh, we're on the sort of beginning of day six, and uh, the creation is just magnificent in its beauty and unfathomable in its complexity. We still don't get it today completely. But God knows there is one piece missing.
missing. And so God said, chapter 1, verse 26 of Genesis, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Male and female, he created them. Imagine this scene, all right? Just, if you were able to be there, that moment, when God is about to make man. The Lord formed the man out of the dust of the ground. Wouldn't that have been an epic thing to see? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God breathing life. And so the man became a living being. We read in 2.7. But then God shows Adam every other creature that he has made for this purpose, to prove to him that there is no other creature that can meet the need of a woman. He needs a woman, a helper, a partner. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, which is, I think, why on Sundays men often need a nap. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and he closed up. God declares, as he looks now at creation with man and woman, that it is very good. See, as we look at that scene, I think it's absolutely clear that God has created with loving care, but also an order with purpose. From night to day, from sea to land, from plants to animals, and finally, man to woman. And in them there is absolute equality, but difference. You see, God is not crushing women at this point. He's not squeezing them. No, he is creating human beings to be like pots for a set purpose that he has designed that will give him glory. So, let's come to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 16, as we hear about this important matter of authority in God's church. Authority in God's church. And as we think about that, I hope today we'll all go away with this this truth, that willing submission and humble leadership both show God's glory. Willing submission and humble leadership both show God's glory. Now we know as we've been working through 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of tension. Uh, it's like reading the wrong end of a pineapple. Uh, there's criticism, there's challenge, and, and there's been some strange things already, and, and today's no less. We're dealing with head coverings, it would seem. And so, as I've encouraged you before, strap on the snorkels, we're going deep uh, to understand what God's got to say to us today. So, join with me, and let's pray to our God. God and Father, press this message to all of our hearts. And ignite a passion in our souls to trust and obey you. Help us to fight off distractions and stubbornness as well. So that we might clearly hear your word and live it. Lord, may this message accomplish your eternal purposes. Amen. So as we think about authority in God's church, we hear the call... To honour God's order. Honour God's order in church. Surprisingly in verse 2, if you have a look at it there, Paul begins with, I praise you. Now, he's had nothing to praise them about. And as we work through chapters 11 to 14, which is all about the gathering, it's all about issues in the gathering. There's nothing to praise them about in terms of what they're doing. But really, it's a to do with the traditions that he talks about. That I think... 
based on other uses of the word in the New Testament. But Paul here is talking about the gospel. They are holding to the gospel and he can praise them for that. But there is an issue with how they're living it out. And so we come to this word or idea of the head. That word head is used 13 times in this 16 verses alone. And I think it's talking about authority. So let's have a look at it. Verse 3. But I want you to realise that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Verse 3 is such an important foundational verse for understanding this passage. So we're going to spend a bit of time here. Some people would say that the, the word head here actually means source or source of life. And we've just heard from Genesis 2 and we've been going, oh yeah, that kind of works. Uh, man gave up a rib in order to give woman life. But there's some issues with it. Firstly, um, when we keep thinking this idea of source... Woman is not saved through man to Christ Jesus. No, all people go directly to Christ. And so man can't be that source of eternal life there. But more importantly, and this is the most important one, when we look at that third relationship, God is not the source of life for Jesus Christ. Jesus was the eternal son. There was never a point where the father made him. And so that's why I'm persuaded it can't be understood as, oh, it's talking about them being a source of life to the other. And finally, Paul actually himself uses the word authority in verse 10. When he says a woman ought to have authority over her own head, someone in authority over her. So as we think about it, talking head, talking about authority, let's look at verse 3 and the three different relationships that Paul unpacks for us here. Number one, the head of every man is Christ. Clearly stating that Christ is the one that has the authority over the man. The man must submit to him in everything. But what does that look like? Well, we know from Christ and the way that he uses his authority that as a man submits, as a man follows Jesus, they are to use their authority in exactly the same way, which was Jesus always used his authority in sacrificial service. Sacrificial service is how a man submits to Christ. It's what took Jesus Christ to the cross. <clears throat> the next relationship is um, between man and woman. But I'm going to skip that for a second and come back in a bit. Let's jump down to number three. That the head of Christ is God. This is a really remarkable uh, relationship and a vital one for our understanding because it's Paul's taking us to the personhood of God. That in our God, the Christian God that we meet in the Bible is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And what we know about that is that they are all absolutely equal. They are all equally God. So head, as we understand it, cannot mean that one is superior to the other, because that's not in God. It cannot mean that it's okay to use your authority to oppress another. That's not in God. What we're talking about here, and what Paul's pointing to, of the head of Christ is God, is Jesus' own willing submission. To his father. And Philippians 2, uh, that great hymn and, and statement of Jesus Christ, just paints that picture so well. If you looked at Ephesians 2, verses 6 to 8, at verse 6 he says, Speaking of Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. It's right there. They are equal, father and son. But Jesus, he says, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus perfectly lived love and humility as he accomplished his Father's will. He submitted himself to it at great cost. This is what we read in Philippians 2.8. 
He humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Christ displayed to the world gospel-shaped submission to his Father, to authority. And when we look at the cross and Jesus willingly going there, we don't see weakness, we see greatness in his submission. So let's come back to the second relationship. That the head of every woman is man. Remembering that man is to sacrificially serve the woman or women as he submits to Christ. And so women also, they follow Christ too. They model his submission as they submit to the leadership of men in the church so important that we see here that it cannot be taken, it cannot be demanded by men. What's talked about here is the willing submission of Christ. Because as a woman submits, she displays Christ. She points to him. She gives glory to God. Now, we might be asking why? Why did God set it up like this? For men and for women. Well, I think it's, it's really remarkable. Through a man's sacrificial service and through a woman's submission in service, it actually brings them into a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because as you sacrificially serve or as you submit, get a better and better understanding of what it was for Jesus to do that and continue to do that. But it's not only for them as they carry out that service and knowing Jesus, as men watch women and women watch men, they too come to a deeper understanding of Jesus who perfectly sacrificed and submitted. Intended to be a wonderful thing. Like a waterfall of glory cascading down. I love seeing waterfalls. And they have all their parts, the source at the top, the, the middle and then the bottom when it reaches the water. And it all flows down. You can't take one part out. But also as you step back, it's the whole thing that makes you marvel and wonder. Just as we are too in God's design. Because men and women are made in the image of God. A God who, in the Trinity, submits, serves, perfectly loves and is absolutely equal. And so that's when Paul starts to write about head coverings. Now, we're probably, the most likely thing we're talking about here is a shawl. It wasn't a veil over the face. But it is a symbolic display of God's order. And it's a way for the women to display the different roles for a woman to a man. In Corinthians, in the Corinthian church, we don't actually know clearly what's going on. We only have one side of the letter. At the very least, there's a small group. It's possible but less likely that all of the women are thinking this. But there are at least some women who are rejecting God's order by coming and serving in church without that symbol. You see, the head covering, it's really just a symptom of that they're in their heart than saying there is no distinction anymore between men and women. So Paul says in verse 5, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. It's really important for us to see that the women are serving in church. Paul wants them to be serving. God wants them to be serving in prayer and prophecy, both upfront ministries in a mixed congregation. What is prophecy? That's at least one, possibly ten other sermons to come. But the point here is that women are serving. And they are, God wants them to. They're essential to the body. 
And so Paul is saying that when a woman has her head covered in those days, they honoured man's God-given role. They recognised it and honoured it. And as they do, they encourage men, the men then to keep serving. That's right, you have a role, keep serving. And the women keep submitting, all within God's church, to point to Jesus Christ, Sunday by Sunday, gathering by gathering, and to give God glory. And so that's why Paul emphasises the opposite effect of when a woman rejects God's order and distinction. He said it's like a woman having her head shaved. Now, even still today, most women, not all, but most women would be reluctant to go outside if they had to have their head shaved. That's what he's talking about. It's, it's the lost opportunity to point to the glory of God and instead there's something missing that they feel. See, the goal here is for women and men in church is that all the glory goes to Jesus Christ. All the glory for him. Not for me as a man or not for a woman as we serve. Men and women serve in different ways in order to point to Christ and to glorify God. C.S. Lewis, a famous author that many of you will know, he wrote about reflecting on the way you, you sort of stand under the midday sun. And at, if you're standing right under the sun, it only casts the barest shadow. And the idea that he's thinking through is that when you step out of that, that you actually start, oh, bang, there's a shadow that identifies, okay, I've moved away from under the sun's light. And what he's talking about here, and it's good for us to be thinking about, is as we're serving, is it for our glory or is it for Christ's? And so he writes, when a man or a woman stands as faithfully as they can under the lordship of Christ or under the sun, they don't have any rivalry for glory. He is everything. That's what Paul is calling us to in this passage, women and men. And that's why we, men and women, are to honour God's order in church. So how? How do we do that? How do we understand a passage like this? Well, for that we need to look to creation, not culture. Creation, not culture. I was chatting to my mum about this passage I was going to preach on and, and she actually mentioned that she used to wear a hat to church every Sunday right up until about 1980. In fact, there was even some gloves going on as well. But we don't do that anymore. Times change. So how do we understand and sit under a passage like this? Paul says in verse 7, A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. He's pointing us to creation. And so remember that Paul has been making it very clear that men are not superior to women. Um, you know, if it was about men and hair, then baldies would have the inside track. But it's not about being more loved or closer to God because you're a man. But it's there. He says, woman is the glory of man. What do we do with that? Well, his point here is that man points to God's image and glory. And, and we are immediately meant to be going back to creation. Not culture, but creation. God doesn't submit to anything that he made, any creature or part of his creation. And man's role symbolises the fact that man too is not to be subject, submissive to any other creature. But if he wears a head covering then it's confusing. It's, it's removing the distinction, that role of pointing to the authority of God. 
And so he says in verse 10, it is for this reason. The reasons he outlines in eight and, verse 8 and 9, uh, man came first, woman came out of man. He says, for that reason that a man ought to have authority over her own head. Someone in authority over her. To keep that analogy, that pointing to God going. He says then, because of the angels. Now, let's just face it, everybody who writes about this is willing to say, we don't actually know what that's about. Not definitively. We do think, because of the, the way that we've heard about the Corinthians so far, that there's this sense of being super spiritually. They've arrived. And so they are thinking of themselves like angels. And that's why earlier on, particularly, uh, we get the sense in the earlier passages and now that the women are thinking, well, that's why I don't need to be married anymore. I can walk away. It's why we shouldn't have sex because I'm like an angel. And it's here. It's why I'm no different to a man because I'm like an angel. That's, that's how we're thinking it's being applied here. But Paul is saying, now we've got to come back to creation, the roles God gave man and woman. Yes, we have this culture of wearing head coverings, and that is in order to display that distinction. In fact, he says in verse 16, all the other churches do this for that reason. Corinthians, if you go away from that, you stand alone. But we rightly say, but that's not our culture right now. It wouldn't mean anything. It wouldn't mean the same thing if we started doing that. And some people would even say, that's not right. So how do we understand a passage like this? What's the right way to approach it? Well, there's some questions uh, that I think are really helpful to humbly understand and obey God's word. The first one that we're talking about already is, is it founded in creation? And we've seen that this is God's design. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it talks about slavery. Slavery is never founded in creation. That's why it shouldn't happen. But here, this is based in God's design. The second question that we should ask is, how does it fit with the rest of the Bible? And on this particular issue, we see through the Old Testament, that God always spoke about and exercised his loving authority as the husband to his wife that is the people of Israel. So it's consistent there and even in the New Testament we have Christ who is deliberately called the head of the church and the church is his bride. So it is consistent with the whole Bible and the third question that we ask is how does it fit with the gospel? And we've already seen that this is pointing us to the Trinity, to God, the Father and the Son, and, and the cross and the Son's willing sacrifice. It's founded in the Gospel. And so when we come to passages like this, people will say things like, well, Paul was writing to a specific situation, a specific culture. Well, actually, every letter Paul wrote. And in fact, the whole Bible is written to specific people in specific situations. That's why it's so real and so helpful but when we come to matters of culture, we need to think these things through. And I encourage you to ask those three questions. Culture is real and it does change. That's why we need to be thinking it through from creation. Today is Father's Day. And you know, depending on what country, let's say, you're in, different gifts will mean different things. There's different cultures at work. If I was to unwrap a present this morning, and there was a dress, I wouldn't be wearing it. But if I was a Scot, and there was a kilt, or I was Fijian, and it was a Sulu, I'd be going, you beauty kids, I'm wearing this to church proudly. You see, culture is different. That's why we need to come back to creation. Creation shows us that men and women are essential and dependent on each other. Verse 11 and 12 make this so clear. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything is from God. God's design from creation provides protection, 
in cultures where women are not valued, uh, that where they are oppressed, that the Bible and, and those who follow it should stand against it. Because we know we are all equal. And we also know that everything is from God. Everyone submits to God. The roles that we have are given by him. And so Christian men and Christian women, we are to embrace expressions or displays of our difference. Men in sacrificial service, women in willing submission, in the service of Christ, in church. And this passage is dealing with church. It's not dealing with society outside of the church. This is where we need to apply this passage. The next extension might be the family. But rather than a list of do this, don't do this, I think the best way forward is for all of us to ask this question. How can I know Christ more deeply? Whether that be through submission or sacrifice. How can I know Christ more? At Harbour Church, yet yeah, we have some formal expressions of this, applying this passage. The senior pastor, the minister, is a male. In the mixed congregations, whether that be church on a Sunday or growth groups, men teach the Bible. It's only done by men in those mixed settings. But there are many informal ways that we can be expressing or displaying our different roles. And I want to say, I am so thankful to God for the Harbour Church women who have that willing spirit of submitting in service of Christ ultimately and pointing to him. We all should be thankful of the witness every week to that and the glory that God has given. In my experience, this only becomes an issue usually when a woman uh, seems to gather around her a small inner circle of followers or supporters. That's when you usually have trouble. It's not necessarily up front like this. And that's something for us to be prayerful about. I'm also thankful to God for the Harbour Church men and their sacrificial service that we all are blessed by. But there is an encouragement today from, to men from God. Don't step backwards because of culture or selfishness. Step forward into sacrificial service. What is very clear from this passage is that there is no place in a Christian church, certainly not in Harbour Church, for women to be oppressed by men. There's no place for that. But also, that we don't agree with the idea that submission means that you are not equal. Because that takes away from the gospel. Jesus willingly submitted himself to the cross, to his Father. Men and women have gifts for service, a call to follow Jesus in service. God is not crushing women. Churches and his word are not squeezing women in a way that they were not made. No, instead, we as a church are called on to enable men and women to be the pots that God made us with purpose and shining the glory on him and pointing to Christ. Authority in God's church is about willing submission and humble leadership to show God's glory. Let me pray. I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Amen. If you've uh, got some more questions or you'd like to chat more about the passage, I'd love to have a chat with you. Uh, please don't doubt that. Uh, chat to me after church or hit me up online and we'll get together. We are now going to have a time to reflect on the words of a song uh, as it's sung. Uh, the words will be up on the stage. We can't sing, but we can pray at this time.
You guys hear me all right? Cool. Today, we've been reminded of the established order in God's church, an order that follows the Trinity's example. Just as God the Son submits willingly to the Father, so women are called to submit to men within the church context. And men, we need to ensure that we are leading sacrificially like Jesus, not for our glory, but for God's. If you would like to partner with Harbour Church financially uh, and be a part of our church in that way, uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, and you can do that either by uh, donating online or at the offertory over there. Um, I must remind you that because of COVID, uh, we can't stay here for long after the service. So when you're ready to leave, uh, don't feel you need to stay. Again, you're more than welcome to invite brothers and sisters uh, to your place after for fellowship uh, in that way. I'll now close our service in prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise for you, for Jesus, and for your spirit. We ask that just as Jesus, although entirely equal to you in divinity, chose to submit to your will and humble himself as a man. We ask that may, we may be able to follow this example at church, that our sisters here will honour you in faithful submission to our brothers, and that our brothers will sacrificially love and lead the church in return. We pray that you will bring an end to COVID soon, if it is your will, Lord. Help us to remain patient, <coughs> patient in waiting for the pandemic to end, and help us to keep faithfully to the laws and regulations our government has set up. Help us to go forward from today in peace, to love and serve you. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a great Father's Day, everybody.